I'm pleased to now introduce to you the chair of our last session of the day, Heather Thompson. Heather is the CEO of the Institute of, and Transport, of Transport and Development Policy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today, both in the room and joining us online. Um, and hopefully uh, there's a number of people joining around the world since I think our time zones are, are coming in line as we get later in the day here uh, in Egypt. Um, so uh, again, uh, my pleasure to be here. My name is Heather Thompson, and I am the CEO of the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. And I want to start by just saying a little bit more about the organization that I'm from, setting the context, and then I'll quickly introduce the other participants and then um, one by one allow them to introduce themselves and set some context as well and then we'll go into some Q&A that we have prepared and then Q&A the, from the audience. Um, so again, I am with the organization ITDP, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, and we are an international non-government organization uh, headquartered in New York City, but with offices around the world staffed by local locals, um, including uh, offices in China, India, Brazil, Mexico, throughout East Africa, and actually here in, uh, in Egypt uh, with an office in Cairo as well. Um, we have more than 35 years of history supporting sustainable, equitable transportation around the world. So it's really an honor to be here to set the context for this panel. Um, so transportation emissions are one of the fastest growing sources of climate emissions around the world. And that's because pop populations are increasing and people are moving to urban centers and more and more people are moving around in cars um, and other forms of highly polluting transportation. Um, so getting in front of this and making sure that we have sustainable, greener forms of transportation is a priority for the world, and particularly a priority in the urban context for passenger vehicles. Um, in the co context of Africa, as we know, and I think many of the panels before us have talked about the fact that African cities are some of the fastest growing cities in the world. Um, and Africa is expected, African cities, some of the um, research that ITDP has just recently uh, released shows that um, African cities will contribute 17% of greenhouse gases by 2050. So this is a huge number and increasing very quickly. Um, this offers immense opportunities and challenges for both urban planning and transportation planning, which is what we want to speak with you all about today, as the continent and the, the metropolitan um, areas are looking for economic development, economic growth, but at the same time trying to meet the needs of their people and allowing more affordability, more equitability, and more access to jobs, health care, and all of that comes with economic growth. So in this session, we're going to look at several opportunities to improve both urban planning and transportation planning. And um, I have two colleagues here in the room with me and one joining online. And between the three of us, um, we'll cover the following topics. One, uh, transit-oriented development. And I'll let my colleague Chris Cost uh, introduce that topic. Uh, number two, the importance of paratransit, which which is often referred to as informal transit, which is very common in cities throughout Africa and the role that that plays in sustainable, equitable transportation. And lastly, uh, and sorry, that's from Paul Curtis. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, with Gail Jennings on the line, um, we'll cover uh, cycling. Um, so again, we're exploring these three topics, um, which have been funded by the High Volume Transit um, Program, uh, Applied Research Program, the HVT Program, which has been funded by UK Aid and um, the UK FCDO Program, um, with an emphasis on work both in Africa as well as South Asia. And today we'll just be covering the context of Africa. And the overall goal is to, again, Again, um, look at transportation and urban planning to ensure accessible, affordable, and climate-friendly transport for all. 
Um, so again, I want to quickly introduce my colleagues here, and then I'll let them um, give a further uh, introduction of themselves and, uh, and their um, sessions. So again, I have um, Chris Cost, who's actually a colleague of mine, um, Africa Director from ITDP. I have Paul uh, Curtis here, who is the Director of the International Group from Vectros. And joining us online is uh, Gail Jennings, who is a research and independent consultant who has worked with the HVT program from some time. And she's joining us remotely from Zambia. And we're crossing our fingers that she's going to have a good connection and she can be here with, with us the whole time. So let me start with you, Chris. Um, I know you want to uh, share with us some insights, again, about transit-oriented oriented development. Um, again, as we know, cities are growing uh, quickly throughout Africa, and often these cities are growing in ways that is leading to sprawl, where transportation is really an afterthought. Um, but we know that transportation really must be core, again, to making sure that people can access what they need as these cities grow and economic development opportunities increase, but doing so in a way that, again, is sustainable, climate friendly, which is why we're here, and equitable. So can you tell us a little bit more about transit-oriented development and um, the context uh, here in Africa? And maybe also you can just say a little bit more about where you live and about the team so we have a sense of that context as well. Great. So thanks a lot, Heather. It's great to be with everyone today, both the audience here and, and also online. Um, so I work with the Africa program at ITDP. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. And we, we have team members across six countries in the Africa region, and, and we provide support on, on the ground in a number of cities. Um, so today we'll talk about a project that we've been implementing on, with support from HVT called City Retrofit. Hopefully we can get the slides up in a moment. Um, so this project looked at how we can take ideas about transit-oriented development and make sure that they see how they can apply in African cities. Um, because a lot of the literature on TOD has focused on the global north, um, so looking at Europe, North America, um, but not looking at cities elsewhere in the world and, and how these principles can be applied there. There we go, great. Um, so to start off, um, when, when we're talking about transit-oriented development, we mean the integration of land use and transport planning so that we can ensure that people have better access to jobs, to education, and other opportunities. Um, because in cities across the continent, um, we're investing in mass rapid transit systems. There are a lot of BRTs under construction in different cities. Um, other cities are working to improve their paratransit, to formalize those systems and improve the service quality but we're not really getting a handle on how we can integrate the land use planning with those transit investments to make sure that we can get the most out of them. So that's what we're talking about when we mean TOD, okay? And there, there are eight key elements that define transit-oriented development, okay? So it starts with having the public transport service, and we need to have high-quality rapid transit that's reliable, um, that's efficient, and can get people to their destinations. And then we need it to be connected to communities with high quality walkways and cycle tracks and good street networks that minimize walking distances to the bus stops. We also need to make sure that along those transit lines we have density, um, that we're concentrating most of the development that's happening within walking distance of that high quality mass rapid transit. And then we need to make sure that that development is mixed use, that it's pedestrian friendly, um, in order to support the use of the, the systems that we've developed. So those are the eight principles of TOD. Um, and altogether, what this means is that we're able to shape the way that people travel because, you know, right now, a lot of the trends in, in land use patterns in African cities are contributing toward the use of private vehicles, right? As Heather said, um, many cities are, are low density, they're sprawling, and, and so it's very hard for people to get to destinations easily by public transport. So we have to change that equation and make sure that the, the transport system in the built form can actually support the use of sustainable mobility because um, that's how we'll get the climate benefits and you know, get on our way toward the 1.5 degree scenario. Whoops. Um, so let's look into those you know, present patterns and, and how they, they differ a bit from the TOD vision. So the first 
idea is that you know just being adjacent to transit doesn't mean that it's transit oriented, right? So you have a lot of cases like this in informal areas of our cities, um, where you know the city's made a, a good investment in the transit system. So you have this high quality BRT in Johannesburg, but if you look at the development that's right next door, it's turning its back on the street, right? So the development's lined by compound walls. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's just a very dead environment in public space. And so that doesn't contribute to the kind of vibrant urban space um, that would lead people to walk, cycle, and use public transport. So we need to see how land use policies and building control regulations can change that kind of outcome. We also have um, the context where there's informal development. You know, this is Dar es Salaam, where the city has come in with this investment in the BRT, but you can see that the development along the BRT has not yet really consolidated um, around that resource that we have. You know, it's still pretty uniformly low density. Um, well, low height, um, the, the, the housing there is very crowded, but the built density, the floor area is very low, right? And so we're not really making use of, of the BRT as much as we could. So in, in this, in this HVT-supported project, we really wanted to see how we can tailor TOD strategies to these diverse contexts that we have in, in African cities. So we need to look at several levels of planning, right? So starting from the city metropolitan level, we need to make sure that we're, we're adopted, adopting transit-oriented zoning. You know, most cities in the Africa region still have the colonial era zoning where some areas that are you know, right on good public transport corridors have very low allowed densities, right? So we're not able to develop those areas according to market demand. Um, you know, and making sure that we have street networks at the metropolitan level. You know, in, in many cities, the, all the traffic's concentrated on, onto a couple of main arterials because we don't have a good street network. So those things all need to change at, at that level. Then you get to the, the local and neighborhood planning. Right? So here, what we're looking at is things like creating a, a, a complete street network at that level. So having small blocks, <clears throat> making sure that the individual developments are permeable um, so that pedestrians can access those areas. Making sure that we, we develop arcades and canopies to, to shelter pedestrians, right? So, you know, so they don't have to deal with rain and, 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 and hot weather, as the case may be. Um, and then finally, at the building level, um, looking at how we can design buildings that have pedestrian-friendly facades so that, um, yeah, we contribute to that active pedestrian environment and, and reduce the parking supply. So I think there's been a lot of progress at, at that level of the this metropolitan and quarter-level planning. You know, so in, in this project, we, we looked at two cities, Dar es Salaam and, and Addis Ababa within the Africa region, and there were also Indian case studies that we took up. In, in, in Dar and Addis, we, both of those cities have good TOD strategies. So Dar es Salaam has adopted a quarter development strategy that looks at how to intensify land uses along the first phase BRT line. And then Addis Ababa has a very progressive master plan that looks at how to encourage more development in areas that have good transit access. But when it, when it comes to local and neighborhood planning and also the building design, that's where we're really falling short. And so that's what we sought to tackle in this project and see how we can work with these cities to develop better local area plans and, and better building control regulations. Okay. So within the African case studies that we took up, these were the, the three station areas that we picked. So in Dar es Salaam, we took up this um, Argentina BRT station area. Um, so it's a largely informal area along the BRT corridor. Um, in Addis Ababa, we, we looked at two areas. So one was Jemo, um, which is right around a planned BRT station. And then finally, there is Gotera, um, where we looked at the, the area around this LRT station. And the, the, the commonality in all these sites was that the cities have, have made efforts to address informality and also look at ways to upgrade housing and expand access to affordable housing. And we wanted to compare and contrast the way that these different cities were able to tackle that. Okay, so just to give you a sense of, of these neighborhoods, so this is the neighborhood in Dar es Salaam. You can see it's a fairly low rise, um, but high density area um, with, with largely informal structure, although there's some you know, new buildings that you know, where people do have you know, clear tenure rights that have been coming up. Um, that's, that's that area. Um, Jemo in Addis Ababa is a, a greenfield 
government housing project um, where the, the city, you know, the city has this large scale condominium program um, that, that's creating this public housing. And, and so they've, that's the kind of typology where you have these, these you know, kind of uniform blocks um, spread over a very large area. Gotera similarly um, has another condominium housing project, but it's in a higher income area. So, so this is sort of a, a mixed income neighborhood, okay? So we took the, the TOD standard, which is a, a, a checklist that ITDP and other organizations develop to evaluate buildings and station areas to see whether they're TOD friendly. And, and so we use that TOD standard to score these three neighborhoods and see how they stack up against those eight principles of TOD. And what we found was that um, if you look at things like density, the compactness, um, we scored very well. So all these areas are, are at least 200 persons per hectare. Um, the, the densities are there. Um, they also score very well when it comes to shift, like the idea of reducing um, car access, because in, you know, especially in the Argentina area that you, that you saw, um, it's very hard to even bring a car into most of those neighborhoods, right? Um, but when it came to the, the, the infrastructure for walking and cycling, um, also the street network, the permeability for pedestrians, that's where we didn't do so well. And even mix was, was a bit surprising um, because some of the, the areas are largely residential. We didn't have a full mix of complementary land uses within the development and between the development and, and outside areas. So we looked at um, how we could address those challenges in these areas um, and, and in several domains. So number one is infrastructure. So yeah, we need to build the basic walking and cycling facilities so that people can get around um, in a dignified way in these neighborhoods. Um, accelerate the investment in the mass rapid transit in the case of Addis Ababa because the, the BRT is a planned corridor, so we need to make sure it materializes soon. Um, and then in Dar es Salaam, because um, the area is, is fairly informal and still doesn't have proper sewage and drainage and water supply networks, we need to bring that into the area um, because those improvements would be really critical for supporting the intensification of land use along the BRT corridor. Without that, it really won't work. Um, when it comes to policies, so there, there are several basic reforms that we need to make in the urban planning policies on the corridor. So re removing the density caps, um, which are there in, in Dar es Salaam, at least. In, in Addis Ababa, um, one good thing is in the master, per the master plan, um, there, there's no maximum FAR on the BRT corridors. Um, um, so, but that needs to happen in, in Dar es Salaam. Removing the setback requirements, so making sure that buildings can come up to the street edge, and having build-to lines so that instead of compound walls lining the main streets, we have active edges. And then removing minimum parking requirements so that we're not forcing people to build extra parking that they don't need in their, in their developments. And then finally, looking at management of public space, so managing vending better, so that when we invest in good walkways, we actually make sure that people can use them, um, and, and managing on-street parking so that cars don't come to dominate the environments in these neighborhoods as they densify. Um, and then for all this, we, we need to have more emphasis on, on maintenance of the infrastructure, because one thing that we found in Dar es Salaam was there had been an effort to upgrade the facilities in that area many years back, but over time, they've you know, many of those improvements kind of faded away because there hasn't been adequate maintenance. So those are some of the key recommendations, and ITDP is now working with the, the respective governments to see how we can bring these into force in actual policies and transform the kind of development that comes up along the corridors and make sure that it can support the transit resource. So that's it from my side. Um, you can read more on our website, and, and we're happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. That was great. Um, and we'll definitely come around to some questions for you. I, I have to say, looking at the photos, I was surprised to see that the neighborhood Argentina in Dar es Salaam scored so highly because it looked like it was 
the most sprawling area, but I, I guess that goes to show if you have an area that is actually permeable with walking and cycle tracks that you can get through a, a neighborhood more quickly, and, and that's really key. Whereas you may have a dense area, but if it's surrounded by gates and walls and there's no way to walk through, <laughs> then you really don't get the benefits of, of that density and, and mixed use. So um, it's, a, it's a great application of the TOD standard to really come up with some good specific guidance, which is what HVT is all about, right? Applied research um, for policy and really making sure that we're influencing decision makers to make the smart choices. Um, so let me turn now to you, Paul, um, to tell us a little bit more about the Transitions Project, um, which is all about, again, the role of para paratransit or informal transit in um, making sure that transportation um, leads to ways that are more uh, accessible and sustainable. And we know that in many, many cities, um, the governments are not providing a real public service that is um, supported by the governments. And instead, we have what is called informal transit or paratransit, where it's essentially um, small independent operators or franchise operators that are providing this very, very important public service. Um, but but without a lot of government support. And so it's often infrequent, not reliable, uh, not safe, and you know, it, it leads to you know, a lot of, um, of concerns in, in the city. So can you tell us a little bit more about the Transitions Project, what you found with your work, and some recommendations that you can share with the audience? Thanks, Heather. Really nice to be here. And um, could we have the slides up, please, when you get a set? Um, just a quick introduction on, on Vectos, so I'm one of the directors there. Um, we recently um, uh, were acquired by SLR Consulting, so we're now an energy, environmental and transport consultancy. The team I lead is looking at uh, research and development projects uh, in Europe, Africa and elsewhere in the field of sustainable urban mobility, but also how we integrate that to um, land use and urban planning. Um, and it was really interesting hearing what you were saying there, Chris, about the, um, like the, the, the standards that you have for, for, for TOD. Um, lots of similarities there with, with, with we, how we approach um, urban planning and the, the sort of methodology we use is avoid, shift and improve. Um, so when it comes to master planning and designing the mobility strategy for a, for a new town or for an urban extension, um, in order to, to realise co-benefits, economic, social, environmental, carbon, um, avoid, shift, improve is, is quite a good tool to use. So avoid basically meaning um, avoid the need to travel beyond your local community. If you plan correctly, um, the best way to reduce carbon from transport emissions is if you don't have to use any vehicles at all. So you can walk and cycle to, the, uh, to, to shops, to education, um, so that's where the, the, the planning comes in. Um, shift is, yes, we need to shift to more um, space-efficient modes, such as public transport, and then improve really relates to the fuels of the vehicles. So that's when we start bringing in electric or hydrogen-powered uh, uh, fleets, but also um, logistics as well. Um, thank, thank you for that. And so the, the Transitions Project really sort of um, comes out of that, and... Um, what it really focused on was how, to, how do we improve the safety, the efficiency, uh, reduce the carbon of the informal public transport sector or, or paratransit. There's lots of different ways of, uh, of calling it. Um, we had uh, six research cities where we delivered uh, an integrated program of, of research. You can see listed there. Um, you know, the, the big headline from that initially is the, the huge percentage mode share of informal public transport in the average African city. So, you know, you could say way over 50% for, for the majority, but um, it's probably not true to say that this sector gets 50% or more of the investment. Um, and so it's really missing a trick by, by not being uh, uh, in receipt of so much uh, financing. Um, the, the research uh, was split over three phases. Um, the, the, the participating cities are, are highlighted there. Um, the first phase, we did a literature review 
on um, looking into how informal public transport is currently managed, operated, what some of the success factors have been, what some of the big challenges are. You can see from the map that the number of publications varied uh, hugely across the continent, uh, with Ghana and Africa, uh, South Africa rather, having the, the majority uh, of research already being conducted on that. We've got a nice report you can download from the HVT website summarising our findings. Uh, then we embarked on the primary research involving stakeholder interviews, passenger surveys, and tracking of, of fuel consumption. And we're now in towards the end of the, the third phase. So um, we've developed a lot of learning about, uh, I'll talk about this a bit more in the questions, but um, you know, what sorts of regulations and enforcement of regulations uh, do we need to see a, a you know, more efficiently operated system? Um, what are the basic infrastructures you know, that you need to have in place um, to improve uh, adherence to those regulations, um, financing opportunities from different sectors, uh, how can we improve fleet maintenance. We've, we found lots of different um, uh, insights and make recommendations from that. And we're putting together this route map tool, which will be online, a web-based tool, free to use um, for the informal public transport sector, but also the, the formal sector and also donor agencies um, all sorts of stakeholders in order to map out how do we firstly sort of self-assess, analyse uh, where, where each city is at and then build a plan on how to improve uh, across different, uh, different categories. I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. Um, I just wanted to plug also, so we have a second HVT project called Empower and that finished last month with a, a really good conference in Lagos where we launched the SheCan tool, and this is really a, um, a practical tool for transport stakeholders of all sectors to firstly collect data on the, uh, the prominence of sexual harassment on and around public transport in sub-Saharan Africa. And then once the data is there, then there's a set of interventions across different categories that can be taken um, in order to tackle that. And it's a really nice tool. Uh, it's gone live. The, the link's down there. Um, and it, it sort of also backs up the uh, objectives of the, the, trans, the Transitions Project in making informal public transport safer, more accessible, more attractive to use. OK, that's my introduction uh, for now. Uh, happy to take questions a little bit later. Cheers. All right. And again, thank you, Paul. <laughs> And we'll come back to some questions to allow you to elaborate on some of the good examples and, and recommendations. Um, let me last turn to Gail. I hope you're there with us online again, calling in from Zambia. There you are. We have you on the big screen okay. here. It's almost like you're here in, in person. So, so glad. We oh, I wish I was. <laughs> well, 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 we'll feel like you're here um, and glad that you have a good connection. So we've sort of gone from macro um, down to uh, what is maybe a bit more micro, but at the most important micro level, which is cycling. Um, so, Gail, a lot of your work is focused uh, currently on world bicycle relief, um, with a focus on the fact that um, currently, and especially in the past, a majority of people in Africa travel by either walking or cycling, um, especially uh, in, in both rural and urban areas. But as um, cities grow, more and more people are turning to motorcycles, both motorcycle taxi fleets as well as independently owned motorcycles. And that is driving people away from, from walking and, and cycling. And we know that cycling has a huge potential. Um, at the same time, um, access roads between rural and urban areas are becoming less accessible. Um, maintenance costs are increasing. Floods caused by climate change are making these roads uh, um, 
more, more and more, I should say, less easier to travel um, and more expensive. Um, but at the same time, we know that people are needing to travel greater distances. Um, the back and forth travel between rural and urban areas in incre is increasing. Um, and at the same time, we have increasing fuel costs um, and uh, other challenges that are just making this whole dynamic um, exacerbated, as well as um, increase in energy security, air quality issues, and of course, all of this is driving um, climate change, which is why we are all here. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about the insights of your work um, with the HVT project and some of the recommendations that you have to share with us today? Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really I'm sorry that I'm not there because it's always uh, great to talk with, with real humans. But I will, I will assume that, um, that uh, you, you are real humans and we can um, have, a, have a discussion. Um, thanks very much, Hila, for that introduction. So I think, firstly, you know, I sneaked in um, a subject around or topic around rural Africa, even though I know I was invited to talk about urban um, Africa, because I think that rural Africa is getting forgotten to some extent in the focus on, on urban. And while the focus on urban it really is completely legitimate, there is a danger that that in other parts of, of countries that I've been working in, there is the slow and steady shift away from walking and cycling to motorized modes. So on the one hand, you've got um, a strong focus in, in urban centers around the need to get people out of private cars or to stop taking motorized transport, to walk and cycle. So what Chris was talking about with, with TOD, trying to develop cities to become places where people can walk and cycle and focusing on infrastructure, which is costly and retrofitting cities and trying to create these environments where people don't have to, have to move by um, motorized modes. So there's a great deal of policy attention, resource allocation, funding, and discussion around creating urban areas to be like this. But at the same time, rural areas are like that. So you can walk to where you need to go. You can cycle to where you need to go. Um, these, are, these are areas that have a very low carbon modes of travel, very low impact. But because they are being neglected in, the, in to some extent, the focus on, on urban. And yes, we know that, that African cities are, you know, that's where everything's happening. There's massive urbanization, but, you know, these are so inextricably linked. And what we're finding, so um, the work that, that I've been doing, for me, I, I have started becoming a lot more interested in, in rural transport through work with HVT that they funded during COVID. And now, as, as Heather mentioned, we, I'm working with World Bicycle Relief to really try and understand the needs of rural cyclists particularly. And these kind of micro needs, what would it take? What do people need to keep cycling rather than make this shift to motorbikes, which which are becoming increasingly, I mean, in cities there, they already are. Some people have described them as being blight. Um, but we are seeing more and more motorbike taxis, motorbikes in rural areas. They are becoming cheaper for people to purchase. They are one more step toward motorized transport. So if you give up your bicycle for a motorbike, your next step might be to, to purchase a vehicle, a car, if you can. But um, there is this, there's this shift to, to motorized transport that is not being sufficiently... Um, understood or not sufficient attention being being given to how things are changing rurally. So I think, um, you know, we need to understand and pay attention to retaining both walking and cycling in rural Africa and growing these modes. But by moving away from what I describe as the captive narrative, where there's this, there's this policy narrative, particularly, and sometimes even an advocacy narrative where, where there's this, it's described as people being forced to walk and cycle. They have no alternative, so they, they have to walk and cycle, as if this is something that, that we should be moving away from, that this is, a, this is an indication of poverty, an indication of poor um, kind of rural accessibility, and this must change. 
So, yeah, I think there's uh, there's a lot more that I can can talk about, but um, but I leave that that there for now, just to to note that that what happens in rural Africa really matters for what happens in in urban in urban Africa and vice versa. Thank you, Gail. Um, and maybe I'll just go ahead and turn it back to you, Gail, with a, a question to you first. I'm going to try and make this a bit dynamic so we won't just go in, go in order here. Um, you, you. you talked about the, the differences between rural and urban um, and the need for cycling in, in both instances. Could you, um, you sort of alluded to this, but maybe talk about a little bit of the recommendations and the approaches to retaining cycling in, in both those instances? And are they similar? Are they different? Um, how, can we, how can we think about that? Well, how long have we got? <laughs> it would be wonderful to sort of talk about, about this because the, these are the burning questions. Um, you know, the, the challenge, or I suppose if we look at it like this, in, in rural areas, people already cycle. They, they want to cycle. There's, there's, the people love cycling. It serves their needs. And work, again, that I'm doing with World Bicycle Relief, where we are trying to understand through things like participatory GIS and mobility mapping and focus groups, trying to understand what do people like about their bicycles? Do, do, does cycling serve their needs? Is this a mode that they would choose to use over and above other modes that they might possibly have access to? And by and large, there's this overwhelming satisfaction with cycling. It meets people's needs. Um, you, yeah. So you, so you've got this this group of people who who would like to have bicycles, more bicycles. Bicycles are expensive. Spare parts are very expensive. Road conditions are poor, but not in the way that we necessarily think that they are poor. So um, what we found in, in this work that we do in five, five, six countries in Africa, what often happens is when there is a funding allocation for rural areas, one of the first things that people would like to do in terms of, of policy direction is tar the roads. And what cyclists have said to us is that this immediately makes cycling very much more dangerous and puts them off cycling because roads are not, vehicles are not traveling a lot faster. There's no longer a safe road shoulder. They stop cycling. One of the barriers or, or um, kind of conditions that cause people to stop cycling is once road, road quality is improved in a particular way, which seems counterintuitive. So you've got this whole rural situation where, where people want to ride, they would like to have more bicycles, they would like to be able to afford more bicycles, they would like, they don't necessarily want higher quality infrastructure in the way we think about it. And then in, in urban areas, which, which Chris would really be able to talk to um, very much better than I would in this instance, is that there you are trying to grow the mode, you're trying to persuade people to cycle. People don't, don't cycle. So an inordinate amount of money and resources need to go into trying to tell people why they should use this mode, persuade people, build infrastructure, set up a whole urban context that makes people want to use a mode that they don't really want to use. Then you have the rural situation where people want to use a mode, but conditions are, not, are getting worse for them, and bicycles are becoming more expensive. So they, they really are two very different, very different kinds of interventions that are required and what we see is that the particularly the NMT policies are very urban focused because that is where the, the kind of urgency feels as if it is that this is where um, your climate mitigation needs to take place in a sense so I don't believe that the NMT policies that we have sufficiently pay attention to rural walking and cycling and again, I'll leave it there for now because it's something we could talk about forever. Thank you. That was a great elaboration. And uh, just so interesting that um, I think your, your response was in both instances, cycling in, in relation to the car, right? Um, in the rural areas, 
if we create roads, it makes it more dangerous for cycling because then there are more roads, or excuse me, more cars traveling mm -hmm. quickly. Um, whereas in the urban context, there are already roads and not enough room for cyclists. And so therefore, again, the danger is there and so much so that we don't even have cyclists, right? So um, it's a really interesting um, dynamic um, coming out from, again, applied research and how we really need to uh, influence policy accordingly. Um, Chris, let me bring it back to you. Um, again, I thought it was so interesting to see the three cities that you compared and how walking and cycling were, were really at the core of that. Um, but also another um, element that um, was common in at least two of the cities, I suppose probably three of the cities, um, was affordable housing. Um, in I think it was two instances, the housing was actually built by government, I assume to be affordable housing, and then in the, in the case of Dar es Salaam, it was more uh, informal housing, but again, um, affordable housing, I assume. Um, and this is an issue that we see all around the world, whether it's um, in the United States or the UK or Brazil or China or many places in Africa, right, where there isn't enough space for affordable housing in our city centers and affordable housing is getting pushed out more and more to the outskirts. Um, and that, of course, is, makes it really challenging for transit-oriented development. People are traveling greater distances. It means um, a necessity of building more transportation corridors, which is just more expensive. So can you talk a little bit more about that dynamic of you know, the benefits of affordable housing, how that ties to TOD, and again, how we can use research to really influence the decision makers? Sure, yeah, yeah. No, this is a really critical part of making TOD work in, in the Africa region, you know, because many of the BRT corridors that we're implementing go right through informal settlements. And there, there's a, a big chance that a lot of those settlements, settlements will be redeveloped and turned into formal housing. And then there's a good chance that the existing residents can be pushed out. And, but those residents happen to be the people who use public transport the most in the city. So we need to see how to tackle that dynamic. And a lot of cities you know, kind of go at this with a knee-jerk reaction of trying to implement rent control or some kind of policy like that. But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, what really improves housing affordability in a city is building more housing, right? And so that starts with removing the arbitrary density caps that we have in a lot of our cities um, that limit the amount of housing that can be built within walking distance of these BRT lines and, and other forms of public transport. And, and so that's the starting point. And the Addis Ababa master plan that I talked about is a, a good example of that, because at least on the, on the transit corridors, on the BRT and light rail corridors, there's no density cap. And in fact, there's a minimum density that you have to meet. Um, and same in the city center. They, they've removed any, any kind of density cap, because that's an area of the city that has really good access by public transport. Um, so, so that's one thing that can be done. Um, Kigali is also following a similar pattern um, where they've given incentives. So if, you know, if, if at least 15% of the units in, in your project are affordable, then you get a 30% higher floor area ratio when you're putting in that development. Um, and that's for projects that are within 75 meters of the BRT network. So there are things that we can do like that at the master planning level. Um, but it's also important to come up with models for how individual projects can be implemented, right? And I would again point to an example from Kigali, um, where the city has been implementing this Impazi rehousing project where they took uh, an area that was informal um, but had very good access to one of the main bus terminals in the city and worked with the local residents to, to redevelop the units that were there. So they ended up replacing the informal housing with new structures. And what they were able to do in the process was they, they were able to give units back to the people who, who had lived on that plot before, um, but at the same time increase the density fourfold so that more people could live close to that bus terminal and, and still have walking access to, to good bus service. So that's the kind of solution that can not only improve the situation in an informal area like that, like fixing the basic infrastructure, you know, bringing in proper sanitation and drainage um, and pedestrian facilities, 
but also increasing the density at the same time. And, and that's what we really want to see in our cities so that we can increase the housing supply, bring down rents, bring down housing costs, and, and have more people living within walking distance of good transit. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's, it's always so great to have some specific examples of, of good things happening. And as you describe it, it just it sounds like a no-brainer, right? It's, it's good for people. It's good for business. It's good for the government. Um, it's basically making the most of limited dollars, which... Uh, or lira, or whatever the currency may be, local currency... Um, uh, which we know we have such a, a challenge um, with all over the world. So um, thanks for those great examples. Um, Paul, now let me turn to you. I know you had alluded to some good examples that you had from your research. Um, so maybe you can share some specific examples of how, again, paratransit is really leading to increased uh, sustainable green transportation in cities in Africa. Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, back in the transitions projects, um, we identified through the research there are broadly four main areas where, where we can in, uh, we can lead to improvements uh, in paratransit. Um, so, firstly, infrastructure, um, sort of fleets, the, the vehicles themselves, the management and operations level, and how that's organised, and then enforcement of regulations that normally already exist but are not always applied. Um, and some examples off the bat. So, in terms of infrastructure. In Cape Town, in, in order to improve the re reliability of journey times, um, they introduced um, uh, a dedicated lane for minibus taxis, to the paratransit there. Um, and in that pilot, it successfully uh, in, in, uh, reduced journey times, which led to less pressure on the drivers because one of the main issues uh, regarding safety is the, the contracts are such normally that the drivers have to make as many journeys uh, per day in order to take home any real salary so that basically means very high speeds where they're able to um, uh, in this pilot what happened actually was that the speed went up um, of the vehicles because they actually had more space to deal with I think that was probably um, you know an initial reaction but over a long term period where journey time reliability is, is more assured then the drivers could adopt slightly more uh, modest uh, speed uh, because they, they know they're still going to make those those targets um, and the slower the vehicles um, or at least um, less stop start then the better the, the fuel efficiency so you can start making some some small gains uh, in that sense um, also in, in Cape Town I was lucky enough uh, a few months ago to be there and I went to um, a, a transit orientated development called Mitchell's Plain um, which is really good to see um, mixed-use development, it's got the bus rapid transit um, as well as railway stations and a, like a huge terminal for minibus taxis. It's, it's been done very well um, and the model works very well there because the minibus taxis really act as the feeder routes into the, the, the transit development so it gives it a really big geographical uh, coverage. Um, but one thing it was slightly sad to see, but the, the railway line had been closed for a little while, and it's meant that um, on one side, the minibus taxi trade was doing very well because the, uh, the existing services there going into the city centre were still, were in fact, bigger demand than ever. On the other side of the tracks, it was, it was like a ghost town because the uh, trips that people were making to get into the, the development... Uh, were no longer being taken because there was no onward train to take. Um, so it, it, sh it showed that the um, uh, sort of funding issues around mass tran transit and the, the risks involved with that, when if that dries up, it can have quite a, a big impact on, on, on the informal um, uh, transport side. Uh, just quickly on fleets, um, you know, in order to make better uh, sort of efficiencies on, on, on vehicles and, and their engines. Uh, fleet renewal is obviously very important. Um, it also can be, can be quite pricey, um, but that's the sort of thing that we could see uh, international financial institutions prioritising in terms of their resources, um, particularly to get carbon gains um, to, to invest in, in, in new fleets. I think the World Bank invested in a new, a new fleet in Dhaka so about 10, 15 years ago, so the precedent is there. Um, and then the holy grail, of course, is to move to electric fleets. And from our research, 
Um, it shows that realistically we're probably a few steps away from there um, in terms of quick wins. I think we just need to make the existing diesel petrol vehicles more fuel efficient. Uh, in Cape Town, they have actually started trialling uh, electric vehicle um, minibus taxis, so it's, it's happening. Um, on a management level, um, there's, uh, there, was a, there was a pilot in, in uh, again in Cape Town where they, they switched the, the type of contracts with drivers from target-based to route-based contracts, and what that did was it reduced fuel consumption and the speeds that the drivers were, were driving um, because they were more assured of a salary regardless of how many um, uh, journeys they were, they were trying to ram into the day. Um, I know time's a bit short, so just on it, in terms of enforcement, which is like the fourth area, um, you know, it's really important that there are regulations, there are routes that are licensed, but some drivers, I think particularly in Ghana, we found that the, uh, the informality of informal transport there was really quite acute, and um, drivers were not stopping at, into, uh, at uh, terminals, they were just stopping um, on the roadside to pick up passengers illegally, but there was a lack of enforcement and policing, and of course that comes down to resources. Um, but that, that does mean that those um, uh, licensed drivers are then in competition with, with others on the same routes, um, which could lead to, re to reduction in, in, in revenue for, for them. But what we did find a good example, going back to Cape Town, the, the BRT, uh, my city, and it seems that the way that that was brought forward was really nice in that it brought informal public transport um, unions and associations and drivers together in the process, and it meant that the, the, a number of the uh, minibus taxi routes um, were designed to feed into the new BRT routes, which is then like a win-win in terms of revenue because you know each is supporting each other. So, um, yeah, lots of good things there. Thank you. Um, I want to come back to you with a follow-up question, but we only have 10 minutes left. I want to make sure to get to another question to Gail. But could you just elaborate on um, the challenge, which you just alluded to, about funding improvements to paratransit services? And, you know, uh, we saw transportation really highlighted at the COP in Glasgow last year. And it's, it's making its way through the channels this year with the Egyptian presidency. And one of the things that they have highlighted is the critical role of informal transportation in the pri uh, priorities that they're elevating and the fact that there needs to be more funding attention um, for improvements and changes to management along the lines of what you just described. So can you just quickly touch upon any recommendations that you have about how we can increase funding for paratransit? Sure. Um, I'll try and talk in bullet point form if that sort of speeds things up a bit. I mean, firstly, I just mentioned there's obviously a business case for greater cooperation between the formal transport sector in cities and the informal um, uh, to collaborate on the routes and to use the informal uh, to act as feeder routes and to increase patronage of the formal. And so everyone's a winner in, in that sense. So there, there could be funding uh, made available at the local level if, if that argument is, is set out. Um, we did a lot of research into the unions and the associations which represent uh, the drivers in, in the informal uh, sector. And what we're seeing slowly, particularly in Cape Town, is uh, what's known as like the professionalization of the informal uh, public transport sector. And what that means is basically you know, improving things like customer care, vehicle standards, um, paying conditions, uh, putting in means to raise finance, to, to, to get loans, to, to, to improve fleets. And what's good to see is um, I, I, we looked at the, the Maputo um, contracts and what the World Bank is demanding is that part, as part of that big investment in the BRT, um, it's, a, it's, it's a requirement for uh, the informal sector to be engaged and professionalization to take place so that there is that, um, that connection and what we would like to see then, those huge sums of money that go into mass transit could start then filtering out into, into the informal. And I can see you're about to cut me off. Um, in terms of fleet renewal, um, what can I say? Okay, in Cape Town, they've got a scrappage system. So that incentivizes the, the, the upgrading of fleets. And I've got loads of others, but um, I'll, I won't hog it. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, Gail, you can see my body language here trying to make sure I defend your time here. Um, but thank you for the, the good examples, Paula. And I, I know, Chris, you're probably on the edge of your seat because I know ITDP has uncovered a lot of good examples as well, um, especially with the integration of things like bus rapid transit system and the informal transit fleets and trying to make sure that the investment that is coming in, especially from development banks, is considering both of those in an integrated fashion. So we're not leaving the paratransit stranded um, with, with poor buses, but we're really thinking about the integration, which is everything from street design to uh, business design to fare system design and, and really thinking about it as a whole system. So I hope we see more uh, attention and success on that here at the, the COP before we're done. Um, Gail, let me give you the last uh, few minutes here. Um, we'll, we'll have a quick wrap-up at the end, but can, you know, you, you talked about the difference between rural and urban areas, but didn't say much about the variety of people that we're really talking about. Um, and you know, I, I know that when we look at the needs of women and men uh, in transportation systems, they're quite different, and also the difference, differences between low and high middle income people. So can you just elaborate a little bit more about your findings and recommendations with those considerations? I'll try and be quick and focus just on, on one thing, really, which is when we talk about, again, about rural and, and different kinds of, of users and bicycles, what we discover is that the kinds of bicycles that people need are not... Or, are not imported or are not easily available or are too expensive. So people have multiple um, uses for bicycles. So they will ride as a as just a normal commute, as we would understand it, but they will carry massive loads. Everybody has seen the photographs of people carrying 200, 250 kgs of, of um, wood or fuel. Um, people carry um, other people, car people carry livestock on their bicycles, they will transport goods to market. So most of the time, when people are buying bicycles, they're buying what they're going to afford, which is a, a second-hand or used bicycle, sometimes third or fourth hand. And one of the first things that they will do is they will modify that bicycle in some way so that it meets their need. <clears throat> so either reinforcing the spokes or putting a, a, a stronger carrier on the back to carry somebody or building like a chicken cage that can go on the back to... So, so, you know, we talk about, about you know, and this might sound like a very kind of prosaic or, or not a really important point, but it's something that people are not, people need different kinds of bicycles. So, and they need bicycles that they can afford because there are so many different kinds of youth, so many different, women want different kinds of bicycles to men. Uh, women want, um, women generally say they want gears, they want a bicycle with a lower crossbar. These kind of bicycles are not available. Or if they are, they're high-end bicycles that, that people cannot afford. And we have been encountering an increasing number of people in fairly unexpected places who've said they've heard about electric bicycles. They've heard about this bicycle that will go up a hill. Um, and so, you know, just, yeah, there's... Taxes on bicycles are very high. Um, in, in Zambia, well, Bicycle Relief has just successfully negotiated with government to reduce the, the import duties. So, I mean, that is going to make a massive difference to the kind of bicycles that people can access. But so just, you know, in that, in that way, you know, we, we, we forget in some respects that bicycles are vehicles and people need different kinds of vehicles. And I can see you already, I can read your body language <laughs> from here. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And we, we have just a few minutes, so I'm going to give you the challenge of each, if you would please, give one sentence final wrap with your recommendation. Um, and Chris, maybe I'll start with you. A quick one sentence final recommendation wrap. Okay, maybe a long one sentence. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, just to say that transit-oriented development is really key to improving affordability in African cities and also addressing the climate crisis. And we really call on development banks and other partners to help mobilize the finance that we're going to need to invest in the urban infrastructure that can really support compact, mixed-use development in African cities. Thanks.
Um, so I think in order for the informal public transport sector to really attract big investment from the international banks, um, uh, a prerequisite now I think is going to be to start the professionalization, um, you know, improve the, the framework in which they're operating, and then because then it's a low risk investment for the international banks and that will probably attract the financing quicker. Thank you. And Gail, I didn't mean to, to cut you off. We'll give you the, the, la the last <laughs> sentence here. <laughs> oh, okay, Orin, I think, it, um, I think one of the things that, that policymakers and decision makers need to, to do is to understand or to stop talking about walking and cycling in this kind of coercive, punitive narrative, as if it's something that um, it's so sad, but people really should be trying to do this. It's not, it's not that kind of mode. And, and if we shift the narrative, um, I think we'll see an enormous amount of change just from that. And Thank you so much. And just like we have seen uh, attention being given to informal transit, we also have seen attention given to walking and cycling as fundamental. I mean, walking and cycling is the most cost-effective means of transport with zero climate <laughs> uh, uh, GHG um, emissions, but also one of the most resilient um, forms of transportation. So I think first and foremost, we should be investing in cycling and walking around the world. And it is great to see that the COP uh, Egyptian presidency this year has has highlighted that in uh, their priorities, given uh, the the huge amount of advocacy that is happening globally, which I'm proud that ITDP has been a big part of. Um, so thank you all for those of you here in the room and those of you joining us online. It's been a real pleasure to moderate this session. Um, hopefully we've brought good, um, forward some good recommendations based on applied research that, again, is really meant to in influence decision makers, and I know all of us are very thankful for the support that we've gotten from the UK government for this important work as part of the HVT project. So thank you so much.